Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Beth Livingston. I currently live in Greensboro, North Carolina, and today we're going to talk about how to hold on to more of your project profits by using a content-first approach. But as always, at WordCamp First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. <laughs> That's my headshot from when I did that little stint in New York. I don't look like that anymore. wish I did. <laughs> but this was my, uh, my avatar everywhere online for a while, and then I felt like I was being not genuine <laughs> by having a, a picture from 2006 up there. Um, but I do have a master's degree in education. My website is WP Roadmaps, and you can get me at that email address. Um, <clears throat> I spent 25 years or more, we won't say how many, um, as a business analyst in the IT consulting space. Um, I was, it's mostly in the financial industry. Let me um, get my slides down here, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, in 2000, back in 2009, you know, that was during the couponing craze. Everybody didn't have any money because the, the market had crashed and all of that. And, but I hate couponing, so I was going to create this web app where, it, where you could create a profile of the stuff you always buy and just tell you where it's on sale. Food Lion, Harris Teeter, Publix, wherever. Great idea. By the time I actually got it launched, when I left corporate IT in 2016, nobody gave a crap. <laughs> The economy had improved. Who knew that an, a, a, a growing economy could make your product obsolete? <laughs> I just didn't know where my audience was. So I said, you know what I'm going to do instead? Because I've, now I've learned so much about um, WordPress, I'm going to um, start building roadmaps, like a complete solution, how to do a membership site, how to do an e-commerce site, front to back, what are the right plugins, what are the right this and that. And then I met Adam Prizer. Does anybody know who, who that is? <laughs> WP Crafter, he has a great Facebook page, a great YouTube channel, um, and he's already doing that, and he's doing a really good job. The man can create 20 videos a day. He's amazing, um, and he'll, he, he does all kinds of uh, evaluations and tests of these plugins, so I'm still in his group, and he's really good. I got to meet him when I was in California. Um, but So he, he made my business obsolete, what I was planning to do, and then I started going to work camps and meetups and started hearing all these complaints about fighting scope creep and uh, how do I could get content from the customer and all these things that I know how to do because I did it for 25 years in IT. So um, I decided to start getting, doing my services for you guys, WordPress deliverers. You know, I hate calling, I'm getting the dry now. <laughs> Let me tell you, you can get up on the stage and pretend to be somebody else not be nervous at all. You get six weeks of rehearsal, you know exactly what you're going to say. But standing up here in front of my peeps, <laughs> whew, it gets you a little nervous and your mouth gets dry. <laughs> so forgive me for that. Um, so I just started, uh, decided to start creating things for you all. And then I delivered a talk at WordCamp Asheville last year. And people came up to me and said, oh my god, we need this, we need you, we need all of this in our, in your, in our community. So um, now I do real life project management skills for WordPress practitioners. So I could keep the same name, WP Roadmaps, it's just my roadmaps are about different things now. <laughs> so that's um, where I am. Oh, now before we get into the content for today, I need y'all's help with something, okay? I am getting ready to launch a product. Um, later this month, and I'm doing that with live webinars, okay? So I need, I'm going to give you, show you two titles on the next slide, and then I want, by a show of hands, for you to tell me which of those titles would grab your attention and make you want to attend a, a live webinar online, okay? Will you help me? Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Okay, so these are my possible masterclass topics. Five surprising secrets to increasing WordPress project profits without raising your prices. And the subtitle is, How Simple Process Changes Can Get 100% of Your... Look, I take lessons from Amy Porterfield. She's like the digital course queen of the world. And she says not to worry about how long the title is. The important thing is to get the point across. So 100% um, uh, so of your projects completed on time and under budget and delight your clients. That's the first one. Number two is why your WordPress design and development skills are no longer enough and what to do about it. Eight client questions you need to be prepared to answer to win the project, even if they don't ask. And then your last choice, 
is neither. Either because you never sign up for webinars, you don't like any of them, either one of those topics, or you have some other reason that I would like for you to tell me privately in the hall. <laughs> okay, so how many people like number one better? Raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. How many like number two better? Okay. Excellent. And how, uh, how many people here are actual, like an agency, you're building websites for other people? Okay. Which one did you say you like better? Oh you're, <laughs> oh, you're in the number three category. See, anytime the title is kind of salesy or kind of pitchy, the really geeky people don't like it. <laughs> Are you a developer? Are you a de I mean that is a term of endearment, you know that. I actually like them both. Uh-huh. Um, I like the top one because it's a little bit more specific. Um, I kind of know what, um, that it's going to kind of get into the nitty gritty. Uh, it's probably more geared towards agencies and stuff where the second one, um, I could see it being appealing more to just the, the beginning freelancer and Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that help, y'all. Yes, Zach? I think psychologically the second one lets you know that there's a need that you have that you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. Like one is I can give you something, the other one is you have a hole in your knowledge that you're not aware of, so it's, it's right. stronger incentivization. Yeah. So if I do topic number two, if I do topic number two, will you sign up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Well, I need you to be there anyway because I just need some support. <laughs> This will be my first live webinar, y'all. Oh, that's cool. Well, and it depends. One, uh, it, I mean, if you're a developer, you're more going to be interested in number two. If you hire developers, you might be more interested in number one. Yeah, well, my target market is developers who manage WordPress projects. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something? I might find a way to combine your use number one and use number two as your subtitle. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have five surprising secrets and eight questions. Oh, you know, I, I had it that way, and I put it out on in a couple of WordPress Facebook groups, and they hated it. <laughs> it was probably a bunch of geeky people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, let's go. Let's move on to the real content, huh? So use the first one, make the five the number five. Oh, okay. You think that'll grab people more? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm doing a total of four, so I was trying to decide should I do one, two of them. That's a great way to do the A-B testing is do the first two using one and the second two doing the other and see how it turns out. Exactly. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the actual content. Okay, so what are you going to learn today? Um, oh, I wanted to tell you that one of the things that Amy says is, um, you know, you really need to get in front of your ideal customer avatar, or ICA as she calls it. And that's one, one thing I love about WordPress. You are all my ICAs. <laughs> so I love that. I did want to mention that. Um, so you're going to learn why should you even think about content-first development. See, um, there's a lot of people out, t out there talking about content-first design. And I'm going to tell you the difference between the two in a minute. But nobody's talking about, I think it goes further than that. I think it is, needs to be content-first all the way through the development product, project process. How content first development differs from content first design. The six steps of content collection. Five content first best practices. And how all of this helps you hold on to your profits more. So, <laughs> so um, let's do a little audience participation before we move on to the details of, of this right here. Um, everybody stand up please. Okay, please sit down if you have completed less than five paid WordPress projects. Okay, if you have ever had a project, if you have ever had a project stall while waiting on content from the client, sit down. Okay, uh, if you have ever completed content activities for the client when it wasn't in the original plan, sit down. Yay, you are all in the right place. <laughs> okay, so um, 
a lot of, to a lot of you, this little scenario I'm getting ready to say will sound very familiar. You got a new client. You've done a great, you know, it was kind of like what Emily was talking about earlier this morning. You've got a great client, a new client. You've done a great job defining the solution and identifying the content the client needs to provide. You've worked with the client to agree upon a schedule to which they will provide the content. You accept a 50% deposit. You get to work on the website. You'll get the other 50% at the end. And the client's first content deadline comes and they don't deliver. So you gently remind them, you coax them, you plead with them, you send them, you send them part of, the, they end up sending you part of the agreed upon content and then it takes several weeks to get the rest. In the meantime, you take on another project to make up for the delay in cash flow. And just when that project is in full swing, the client, first client finally delivers their content and wants you to meet the originally agreed upon date. So chances are, if you have been doing this for any period of time, you've experienced something similar to that scenario. <laughs> Um, I'm going to tell you why that doesn't work. Okay, here's the traditional development method. The first thing that's wrong with this graphic is that the phases are not all the same size. But you see where content sticks right in the middle and that's where your project is always going to stall. So we're going to talk about a completely different way to structure your payment schedule. And just give up that 50% stuff. It does not work. Okay, so let me ask you this question. How long, if you had everything up on the shelf, all your plugins, you already knew how you were going to configure them, you already knew all of that, um, and you had all your content right there waiting for you, how long would it actually take you to build a website? Right, well, depending on how many pages. If it's a five-page brochure site, I can do that in an hour, right? Okay, so um, this, is, this is the best of all possible worlds and exactly where we want to be. So the difference is a content-first design is that you consider the totality of the content before creating the design. Doesn't mean that you have it all in your hand, it's you're considering it. And I, uh, this was actually clarified by Jennifer Bourne in Orange County when she gave a talk and said, she was talking about how people, she doesn't believe in content first development, she, that you get all the content up front. She says, this is what content design was supposed to be, okay? But there's another piece, which is content-first development, and, and I believe. Because the result of content-first design is that you get a design that best accommodates the content. Content-first development is that you don't build until you get all the content. And the result is you get the same result as content-first design, plus it puts the proper resource into control, the project is less likely to stall, development time is reduced, and that helps you to hold on to more of your ROI. So I just showed you how development time can go to practically nothing if you've got everything all lined up. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of issue, I mean, a lot of best practices, a lot of processes that you're probably going to need to change if you want to employ this, this uh, procedure. So the six, six steps of content collection are determine the initial content requirements, craft an initial content estimate, set client expectations regarding content, refine content needs, populate your content collection mechanism, and manage the content collection activities. And we're going to go into each one of these a little more deeply. But before we do that, you know, I hate to say this. I'm in a lot of these um, WordPress uh, Facebook groups, okay? And they classify people into two groups. Notice I'm not doing the classifying, okay? This is the way I hear it. There are button pushers and then there are consultants. Okay, so which you're either just you're going to build websites and that's all you're going to do, or you're going to manage the project. And even the ones that tout themselves as consultants have the client's content activity. If the client insists on doing the content as one giant chunk, and they don't do any estimating for it, that's silly. You're the project manager. You have to figure out how big is that task and make the client aware of how big the task is. And a lot of times, it'll make them realize they don't, they're not qualified to do it. I have a blog article on my website, how to convince your client they are not the right resource for content. Okay, so if you're going to determine initial content requirements, uh, the first thing you're going to do is start with a visual site map. Then you are, oh, you're going to uh, then take that stuff that's on the site map and see how many regular pages you have, how many gallery pages, how many product pages. I break it down into those three groups because anything that's not a gallery or product page is a regular page. So why are you estimating content? It was just what I said a minute ago. It is your job to manage the project, not just the part you're doing, but the whole project. And your client will thank you for this. 
So it's our job to manage the project. You create a rough order of magnitude of the, of the content that's going to be required for this website and you show that to the client. It can be a selling tool if you offer copywriting services or you have a partner that does the copywriting for you. You can send them some business this way. And it also is a good basis for your initial project estimate. All right, I'm going to go off on a little um, soapbox here for a second. And Emily brought it up this morning too. Stop calling it a quote. It is not a quote, it is an estimate. Because estimates change. Quotes is like the guy's coming to build a fence in your yard. He can measure it, he knows exactly what materials he's gonna use and exactly how much it's gonna cost. Until you do a deep dive, until you get really into the nitty gritty details of your customer's business requirements, um, you can't give them an accurate, oh, I almost said accurate estimate, which you can't say either because there's no such thing. <laughs> Estimate, it, it implies that it will change and it will probably change over the course of the project. That's a whole nother topic for another day. Okay, so um, to do this, what I do is I take each one of those pages individually, I list them on a spreadsheet, I use a spreadsheet, um, and I estimate, okay, how many paragraphs do I think are gonna be on that page? How many images, how many videos, products, forms, and tables? Because all of those, that's the, all the forms of content that I generally use, okay? So there's a, an example of, I have a tool, it's a content estimator tool, and it does the calculation on the last tab for all of this. Um, this is just an example of, of how I do it. I'm kind of old school too, y'all. I've been around since you know Windows was a toy and no self-respecting business would use a Mac. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is the final page of my rough order of magnitude estimate, where then I give, okay, if they're, um, if it takes 15 minutes to write a paragraph, and that's just an arbitrary number I pulled out of the sky, okay? So whatever you think is the estimate there, um, and five minutes per image, eight hours per video, and so forth, and then I came up with the total number of man hours. And when you show that to a client, it's impactful. Then they finally go, you know, I don't think we can write all that content by the due date, you know? Or, and then it convinces them to get help. All right, setting the client expectations regarding um, content is first you need a content management process you need to write it down what is it and you need to share it with your client when you're going through the proposal this is how we handle content now if you're doing the content first thing then you need to explain that to them you want to explain common content issues this is another one of my big things I get on my soapbox about you have to be brutally honest with the client about things that typically go wrong in a project don't just not mention them because you're going to try to not for it not to happen it's going to happen so tell them, usually content stalls when the client doesn't meet their delivery date and we're gonna put some processes in place to make sure that doesn't happen. How can they not like that? Your job is, if they're not necessarily the best resource for the job, that's part of your job is to convince them they're not. I don't care how much money they think they're gonna save. It's not in their best interest in the long run. And then I explain to them what's gonna happen if the content is not delivered on time and then you show them that rough order of magnitude. So that's how you set the, con the client's expectations regarding content, it's very important. Another thing you can do is incentivize. Here's what I sometimes do. If during the first couple of meetings I'm getting the feeling, because hey, trust your gut, all right? If you're feeling like they're not probably gonna get it done on time, they're probably not, like they're, they're overworked or their staff is just too, too busy. Um, I sometimes, and I do not pad estimates, okay? But I will add like 500 bucks to the estimate and say, if you get your content in on time, I will take 500 off the total. So I'm not really out any money, but they feel like they got a bargain and it gives them a, uh, an incentive to get that done. Or $1,000 or $5,000, whatever you want to use. Um, so when you, uh, step four, did I go too far? Hold on. Now I'm trying to go backwards. Hold on. Oh, step three. We were still on step three, which is set the client expectations. Okay, step four, refine the content needs. This is when you review the rough order of magnitude with the client, assign the activities, because you've had conversations about who is going to do it. It could be you, could be the client, could be a third party. So you gotta assign those activities, create your content specification. Um, you can use a variety of things to do that. We'll come. So populate the content collection mechanism. All right, depending on the complexity of your project and your client, and their ability to handle technology. 
there are a number of tools you can use. I use Slick Plan to create sitemaps, but I'm moving over to Content Snare for getting the content from the client. Um, and then sometimes, if it's really small, I just use a spreadsheet. And I manage the client, or just paper. Um, I do have some, I'm working on some uh, paper templates for content specification. And then you can just translate that into whatever tool you decide to use. You know, every online tool, every theme, every plugin, every hosting company, it's all like religion. Everybody thinks their way is the only way to heaven and everybody else is misguided. <laughs> so don't listen to all that crap you hear online about this hosting company sucks and all that stuff. I was so happy to hear Chris say that because I've been preaching that forever. Because if you get better at your job, chances are the bad hosting company that was bad 10 years ago, that has a bad reputation, they're probably better at their job now too. So just my thing. All right, step six, manage the content collection activities. Break the job down for the client. You know, I make it easy for them. Give them little goals to reach and then they feel like they've satisfied themselves. Or if you're doing that incentivized thing, you can give them a little, little piece of money every time they meet a deadline and eke it out that way. Then it's your job to ensure that the content is being delivered to the repository, whatever that is, paper, um, a tool, whatever. Ensure that content is being delivered in the proper format. Have regular status calls with the client. This is another thing I can't believe people don't do. I mean, in corporate IT, Every week, come hell or high water, you had, a stat, you had a project status meeting. And everybody had to talk about the action items from last week and what you got done and what you didn't get done. And it not only helps the client, it helps your relationship with the client, but it helps you know where you are. Um, and then offer help to the client if they need it, but always charge. And if there are signs that the dates will be missed, invoke the change control process immediately. How many people have a written change control process, wait for the rest of the question, that you follow without exception? Exactly. See, this is the problem. <laughs> you need to put a change control process in place. Good news for you, I got a free one for you. On my website, if you go to wproadmaps forward slash templates, I have a sample change control process you can download. Um, you do have to give me your email address. It's an opt-in, sorry. <laughs> But for your email address, you're going to get some good content here. Okay, so let's talk about content first best practices. When is my time up? I feel like I'm going long already. Do I go all the way to 12? Okay. Um, content first best practices. Use a two-step proposal process, and I'll explain that in a little more detail in a minute. Restructure your payment schedule. Embrace the idea of a minimum viable website. Structure the project plan for content first and automate where possible. That should be the last step in everything you do. <laughs> automate where possible. All right, so let's talk about this two-step proposal process. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not for everybody. Some people complain about this. It's, oh, that's overkill for a WordPress project. I can get everything I need in that first meeting with the client. I say, I call BS, but that's what they say, just making that disclaimer, this is not for everybody. All right, so let me describe it to you. I should have put it on the slide, but, um, okay, when I do a proposal, and Emily talked about this, about not being too precise in your proposal, I give a range estimate of cost, um, and, and, a, a range co and a range estimate for time, and then, I make the first phase the deep dive discovery and they give me a deposit. If they accept the proposal, they give me a deposit that covers all the way through that process. So I give them the option to back out after that. And the, and I, but only if the new estimate that after I did the deep dive and then, then if we found things that we didn't know about, they get documented, the client is right there with you the whole way. So they are fully aware of why the second estimate is more. But generally, it, most of the time, I don't, it doesn't exceed. So if it doesn't exceed, they don't get a chance to cancel. But if it goes over the original estimate, then I give them the option to cancel. They hardly ever do, though, because they've been there with you the whole time. But if they do, I just hand them that detailed statement of work. They go, I, they've already paid for it. They go off and find somebody else to implement my solution. And that's the other thing that happens sometimes when all we do is drop off a, a proposal and say, um, you know, uh, just call me. 
or I'll call you in a day or two. Never a good idea, always a walkthrough. But, um, so uh, you hand a statement of work and go on to a client that suits you better. So there's always another client around the corner and we tend to make allowances on our processes and the things that we do because we don't want to lose the client. There's another one down the street, trust me. So um, when you use this two-step proposal process, you don't have to pad the estimate because you're, you're just doing a, a global estimate to begin with. Then you're uh, getting down into the deep dive and documenting as you go things you find that are going to change the, um, the first estimate. So by using this process, you get rid of the pad. It prevents doing a lot of work for zero dollars. How many people have spent hours, hours, hours and hours on a proposal, I mean, it is the killer proposal of all time, and you know you've nailed it, and you hear crickets. Happens to everybody. Um, don't do that. It's okay if you know what the client needs. Don't write it all down. Make it, um, I forget the words that Emily used this morning, but you need to be, you know, tell what the, what the, what the stuff is without saying all the nitty gritty detail, because they don't care. They just want to know that you're going to get their business needs met with their website. Some of them care about the design and the color, but they don't care about, they don't care about your technical skills. Okay, restructure the payment schedule. This is how I do it, okay? So other people might do it a little differently, but this is how I make sure I get paid for that deep dive discovery. Upon acceptance of the proposal, they give me that deposit that covers me all the way through the statement of work. Upon acceptance of the statement of work, I, take, I, I usually get 50% of whatever's left. Then we go to client, we go to content activities. <laughs> At the completion of testing, now see, my phases are, are a little different, so this is kind of a generic thing. I'll show, I don't think I have the, my, the phases that I use in here. But basically I have development and testing in the same phase. So at the end of development and testing, you get, uh, you, I use 50%, then I get 50% of whatever's left. And then at the completion of training, that's when the rest of the funds are due. Notice I didn't say at launch. Because there's people, I'm, you may have, might, some of you may have had this happen, where you've built it on the client's environment, bad idea. You built it on the client's environment, you get all the way down to acceptance, and you never get paid for that last leg. And this is another reason I do it this way, because if that were to happen, doesn't happen because I don't, I don't make it live on their site until after I've gotten those all remaining funds. But if it does happen, it's only a little fraction of the, of the money because I've been getting these incremental payments for different milestones in the project plan. Does that make sense? All right. Embrace the minimum viable website. Okay, so you got a client, maybe they're moving a site. So they've got some content, right? But they want to do all this stuff, and you already know that ain't not going to happen by that due date. <laughs> um, then start with what they have and go ahead, get, try to convince them to launch with a minimum. But what is the very minimum that you need to have out there to meet your business requirements? Do that, and then we'll do the rest in a phase two after we do the deep dive discovery and collect all the content. Does that make sense? Okay, structure the project plan for, oh yeah, here are my phases. Now this will make more sense. So um, I call phase zero a zero because I don't consider it a project until the proposal's been accepted. So my first phase in my process is proposal creation and that's where I estimate the needed content. Then project definition is where I identify who's gonna do it and when and I estimate again. It's another thing we think we can do this estimate at the beginning of the project and never estimate again. That's cray cray. So you gotta estimate all along the project. Um, and of course if this is a five page brochure site that you finish in a week, this is a little bit of overkill, okay? But the principles still apply, so um, you can scale it down. Then I do design and preparation. This is when we the client, the third party, or me, collects all the content as well as getting the environment set up. And, you know, but, and I may do a mock-up, but I, I, no development work has taken place yet at all. First three phases, no development work then development and testing, and then deployment and training, which is weird because development becomes almost the anti-climax <laughs> of the whole thing. Because if you've got that plan and everything up on the shelf ready to go, development's easy, testing's easier, deployment and training are both easier. And then automate where possible. And I showed you some of these things before. One new thing on the market uh, that just came out 
is WP Feedback. It's a new plugin. Most of those others are external to WordPress. They're just, they're just for anybody, any kind of project. WP Feedback is a way to get, um, I've not actually had time to look at it. I wanted to, but I haven't. Excuse me. But I do know that the premise is that you have built either mock pages or actually on the, on the site that you're building, and your client can come in and leave comments on specific areas of the website, like change this color of this button to a different color or whatever their comments are. So how many learned something so far that they want to incorporate into their business? Please raise your hand. Really? Just five of you? <laughs> Kidding. There's more people back there. <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's do a little recap. The six steps of content collection. Determine your requirements. Craft the content estimate. Set your client expectations regarding content. Refine the content needs. Populate your content collection mechanism. Manage the content collection activities. And our, um, our best practices when you're implementing are using a two-step approval process or some way that you get paid for that deep dive. Restructure your payment schedule. Embrace the idea of the minimum viable website. Structure the project plan for content first. And automate where possible. Now, if you want to learn more, I have some freebies on my website. One is um, how to use a project notebook for um, making yourself better at what you do. Um, and I'm going to change that cover. I just really fell in love with the Scope Creep Wapu. Oh, you guys are familiar with Wapus, right? <laughs> I love him. He's a villain. They call him a villain. Uh, but I don't like the cover. Anyway, six easy ways to control scope creep in your project proposal. And that one actually has some language in it that you could maybe scarf out and use in your own uh, projects. And then I also, the, the last one, I base all of uh, what, I, the, what I'm teaching and what I do on the six principles of productivity management for software development that John Keane developed back in the 80s. And um, I've taken those six principles and modified them and made them specific for WordPress. And so that is like a little short mini course so, um, that you can sign up for and go through the modules. And it talks about all those principles. And it's, you know, it's, it's Chris talked about one this morning. It's, um, it's common sense stuff that we forget, like defining the job in detail before you start getting to work. You know, that was actually one of the things Chris mentioned as one of the mistakes he made when the client accepted too quickly because he didn't really do enough discovery. Um, oh, and again, if you want that sample change control procedure, go to wpredmaps.com forward slash templates, or there's also a templates menu item on the main page. Or these two Facebook groups. One of them is uh, WordPress Project Management. I administer that one. Hold on, please. The other one is the admin bar. There's two guys that run it. They have a podcast and this Facebook group, and they focus more on the business side, streamlining the business side of what you do. They evaluate different tools. They put different processes in place, and they're very open about it, and they're just really fun to hang out with. <laughs> I love them. Um, so that's another one you might want to check out. My name's Beth Livingston, and that's my presentation. And I would certainly love it if you liked what you heard here today. If you could give me some social media love, I would certainly appreciate that. And then, oh, if you just want to be kept abreast of this product I have coming out, and you don't want any of those freebies, and you just, you know, you can just text roadmaps to 444-999, and you will get on my email list, and then I will let you know about this product I have coming out that I think you'll really like. Are there any questions? This always scares me when there aren't any questions. I can't be that good. Oh, yes. Um, there's also a menu item on my main page for WordCamp, and it's got all of my talks there. It's got the slides for all of them, and then it's got the videos from the ones that have been posted on WordPress.tv. And if you don't know about WordPress.tv, that's where they post all the WordCamp talks. So um, if you saw something on the schedule today that you missed and you really wanted to go to it, you still have an opportunity to watch it. I love that because I really wanted to go to Europe and I don't get to go, so <laughs> I'm anxious to watch the talks from Europe. That'll be interesting. Really no questions about content first? Is anybody going to try it? You mentioned that you have a post about convincing your clients that they're not the best source of content for their 
Yeah, just go to my blog. Is there like a, like a top tip that you want to share about? Showing them that ROM. I mean, that's, that's the biggest one right there. Um, you know, and just, I can't even remember what all I put in there, but it's like a checklist. I'm sorry, I really drank too much last night. I can't remember what is in my blog article. <laughs> I just wrote it last week. It was like one of those things where you just said, ooh, I need to shoot this off, and you write it real fast, and it comes out really good, so you go ahead and post it. But I didn't really think too much about it because it's kind of, you know, common sense to me. So, is anybody going to try this? Any of this? Yes, you are? Okay, good. Wh which piece of it do you like the best? I think when you broke it down, you're like, oh yeah, 15 paragraphs, all that sort of thing, it does actually add some value. When you're trying to sell a website to someone, you kind of hover between, all right, we're not doing a $10,000 website for you, we're not coding the whole thing from like scratch to scratch, but like we are putting a whole bunch of work into it and a lot of thought. Here, here it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's another thing that, that t people tend to struggle with is, and complain about. My client just doesn't understand how much effort it's put into all this, and they don't understand how a project runs, and they don't understand this. If you are saying my client doesn't understand, that's your fault. You need to explain it to them. They don't work and they don't have their head in all this geeky stuff all the time like we do. I'm shocked how much they don't know. If you, whatever you think your client knows, subtract 70% and then teach it to them that way. I mean, that's why those dummies books came out, y'all. Because, you know, my dad told me before those books came out, he said, you need to write a book like that shows how dummies how to use computers, and then those books came out. It was very interesting. Well, okay, so I finished up a little early. Can you back up a slide to your Facebook? I'm trying to look. Oh, the Facebook groups, yeah, sure. Anybody else, question? I must just be a kick-ass teacher, that's all. <laughs> Uh-oh, are you going to have to edit that out of the video? Was that a bad word? <laughs> I said one in Atlanta. No, where was it? Miami. No, it was here last year. I said a bad word in my speech, and I immediately went to the, to the cameraman and said, Oh, my God, oh, my God, can you edit that out? And he said, It's already gone. <laughs> I was like, Yes. <laughs> so, um, you can do it in your own webinar. Yes, I, but I, I'm not really a cursor, but sometimes you just need a curse word. Yes, exactly. Oh, a question. I'm so happy. Yeah, you talked a little bit about creating a motivated client, um, and a lot of it was within the actual uh, estimate. Could you talk a little bit more about different ways to motivate clients without tapping into the estimate? Motivate clients to deliver content? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's hard to break it down into only content, right? Because the setting the client expectations, you need to include your processes in your proposal. And you need to go over each one of those proposals, each one of those processes with the client. You're doing two things here. Remember, you're shopping for a client too. They're not just shopping for a provider. You get to pick. So if you're walking through this proposal and they're saying, well, that seems like a lot of work. Well, that, I don't like, you, you mean I got, so I use a change budget. Okay, this isn't part of this topic, but I'm gonna tell you real quick. If you did a true estimate using real hours and real stuff and didn't just pull a number out of the air, and then you take a percentage of that, I usually use 20 to 30% depending on the client, and add that to the project, it's not a pad, it's set aside in a change budget. They're in control of that change budget, and when you implement your, your change control process, they get to decide, are we going to use that money out of that bucket or not? It seriously reduces the frivolous request for change, gets them motivated to get their stuff done on time, because that change budget, it, it means if I lose time, we're losing money too, right? So um, that's one way I do it, is with the change control procedure. And if they balk at that, if they balk at the, at the change budget, bye bye Or what they say now, bye Sheila. It's, what, I don't get what that means, but anyway. <laughs> that, does that help at all? Okay. Anybody else? All right, let's go have lunch. Oh, and let me just say, I am, oh, oh I wanted to tell y'all. Did I tell you that? That last year, WordCamp Asheville changed my life. Yeah, okay, so I gave that talk, and because it was so well received is when I said, this is when I need, this is what I need to do. 
I need to create something for these people that helps them with that. And that all happened here at WordCamp. And if I hadn't been at WordCamp, I would have been floundering around forever trying to figure out what it is I needed to do to pull all of my talents together. So, and you know what, don't you feel like it's kind of like summer camp for geeks? I love it. I love being with all you people. So go out, have lunch, meet somebody new. Bye, y'all. Thank you.